Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I welcome you to this afternoon session. Uh, we have been talking about uh, the global <coughs> crisis this morning. Uh, and this session basically is concentrated on the effect of uh, the Pakistan right? the local uh, effect of this. Mr. Sadiq said that this morning, when he mentioned that the uh, Pakistan economy has historically been open and it was not immune to have whatever is going on globally. Uh, Salim Raza Sahib, uh, he, meant, he talked about uh, the role of regulators and uh, he also touched briefly on governance issues. And uh, we are going to see that happening. Recently, an article was uh, published uh, in John and uh, it uh, also mentioned a few points that I have here. Uh, that, uh, the impact of the global financial crisis, what is this uh, going to be on Pakistan? The negatives are mainly due to the existing state of economy and governance issues. Uh, the, the negative impact of uh, the global events is not going to be very significant here. Because Pakistan's financial market and banking industry has a very low level of uh, international linkage. Link and it says uh, generally international trade should be affected due to people losing jobs in US and Europe and buying power reduction, but Pakistan would benefit from the falling uh, commodity prices. <coughs> right? So, I mean, it uh, can be an opportunity for our economy also. It says, I mean, uh, for example, uh, essential commodities like oil, uh, if, if the prices of oil decline, we are going to benefit from it. The cost of production is going to reduce here. And another thing that uh, it says is that, that uh, we are not at the higher end of the exports. We are not um, exporting uh, Mercedes or car or luxury items. We are at very essential work. So we are not going to be affected by this. And basically our commodity exports are going to get a boost. One uh, negative Another thing it says that the growth rate is already at the rock bottom of 2.4 percent. So I mean, it can only at this rate our linkages are already too low to be affected by foreign factors. So uh, one negative uh, point, possible uh, thing is that, that our people working outside because uh, the foreign remittances is one of the major uh, sources of uh, foreign exchange earnings for us. So I mean, that may decline because our people may lose jobs. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, it also says that it may be uh, a temporary effect because I mean, those people who come back with all those money, all that money that they have earned for uh, the decades, so they are going to involve themselves into some entrepreneurial uh, activities there. And that will continue in the long run, which will be good for uh, uh, our economy. Some points uh, that I also note down from the prevailing condition, the per prayer, I mean, that we have to concentrate upon is the prevailing law and order situation here. Uh, unfriendly great regulatory environment for local investment, that is there. Um, the bureaucracy, uh, bureaucratic procedures, they are uh, ingress and street breakers type of thing. The potential regulations that look more at the financial standing rather than the earning potential. Uh, give you an example. Uh, these banks, so many banks, they have offered uh, these personal loans up to 500,000 rupees without asking what are you going to do with this, right? They don't look at the productivity of that loan, the usage of that loan. Uh, this scarce resource, um, this should be, uh, this uh, seems to be an inefficient use of those loans, that uh, resource. So, I mean, Sumro Sahib Subha, when he was uh, acting as a uh, chief of the bank, Eurobank, uh, he said that if they were rescue funds, they will be at the tougher conditions, right? So why only that? Why only that? Why don't you, I mean, why do you let things go uh, in a wrong direction and then if they are out of control, then you come up with these type of terms. If you start managing them uh, right from the beginning, it will be efficiently used and it will be product much more productive. So that is uh, Absence of guidance and training to start business uh, for potential entrepreneurs that return to Pakistan. Uh, that is there. I mean, for example, I mean, if we take uh, my again uh, 
talk about the Turkish economy. Uh, those people are returning from Germany with their money and they are starting their business. They have contributed a lot to, a lot to the progress of the Turkish economy. So I think we can have the same benefit, that kind of benefit, if we have some setup here to train those people who are coming back, to give them opportunities to uh, have integrated <laughs> Uh, an estimate uh, is that at least seven percent growth is required to stop the trend of growing poverty. Uh, we talked about poverty, Dr. Uh, in the morning is that globally the poverty has reduced, but in Pakistan, what we see is that, that the poverty is increasing. So we have to stop this trend and reverse this trend. So uh, an estimate was that uh, at least seven percent growth uh, is required to reverse this trend. So, all those things, governance issues are there. So uh, I invite uh, Dr. Mustafa, uh, because he is the Chief Economic Advisor of the State Bank of Pakistan, part of the controlling body here. So he will be enlightening you on these issues. Chief Dr. Thank you. Selection 
criteria was too objective. By too objective, I meant that you know, if you met certain criteria and you tick the boxes, you got in. As we know now, that there were countries who fought for this, who played with the numbers just to get in. Now, one thing we need to understand is in a monetary union, common currency, fiscal is underlined. They're not separate things. And I think the bottom hand in Europe was meant for the easier way. And the tougher part, they just forgot about it. Uh, and the discipline wasn't there, right? I mean, monitoring and enforcing is really difficult with sovereigns. I mean, for one country to tell another country how to behave, it's just it's, it's pretty tough. <coughs> My view would have been that they should have been more uh, research into the countries, their history, to try to get an understanding to say that, you know, who would be anchoring the Europe and who would be gaining a you know, an unequal part. We should have been different. I completely agree with the views that have been put forward earlier that the problem countries did different things. Right? I mean, Iceland is not part of the euro, but it really started the story. Because, you know, it went out of control, borrowing a lot. But that sort of resulted in other countries there being exposed as well. Greek, I agree completely, has a fiscal problem. Okay. Uh, and it's uh, public sector is broken and broken and efficient. I mean, I think some of the points that Zubair Sombu raised were completely valid. Uh, you cannot compare the way, let's say, the, the German bureaucracy works, the public sector over there works, and how it works in, in Greece. Spain and Ireland, uh, a banking issue, borrowed heavily from the other side, primarily for real estate development domestically. Okay. Now, the solutions that have come forward so far, the Irish government are under the Irish banks but the Spanish are looking for EU help. So everything will have to be customized. There is a view which I think increasingly people don't realize that central banks cannot create value in the air. They can print money, but you have to understand that's a liability and against that you need an asset. Okay. So that's why, you know, this idea that you know ECB can just print uh, and, and, and give the money to uh, the poorer countries and the poorer banks and the vulnerable banks means there's going to be an asset underlying it. That means it has to be government bond at some level. And that's something to keep in mind. Eventually, the governments will have to underwrite this. Okay? Which means for them, they will have to go into small strategy. The more discipline, all the less discipline. That's what I think the problems will be. I feel, and I think it's extremely important for us to even focus on the political and social dimensions of this. Because national differences are gained by the trash. And these are mature democracies. So people will speak. If they don't like it, please, they will say it and they ask. The solution, as I said, is not going to be easy. The burden, again, people have said, the burden has shifted. In a sense, the bailout have, has actually allowed private investors to be to walk away relatively unscathed. Not as much, but relatively. The governments are taking more and more of the burden. And it's not even. Right? You have these three countries like Germany, Netherlands. Austria, Finland, Estonia. And then you have the problem countries, right? Greece, Spain, Ireland, Portugal. The problem is that these countries have the resources to pay out the undisciplined. And that creates an uneven setup to begin with. And it's not from the distant savings, because most of these countries are in the selection. It has to be from the future savings. My view is to say that, you know, the credibility of the country and the discipline of that country is extremely important because if you tell five countries to do something, maybe two will. The issue is do those two continue to be on those other three? That's the problem. Again, I mean, compared to what happened, and you have to also realize, you know, the fiscal test that I think someone spoke about earlier, to say that, okay, we're going to ask the country, we have the country connect and say that they don't want fiscal services going forward. How credible are those limits? Everyone would say, yes, give us the money now, but then two years later say we have problems. Someone has to pay the bill. Okay. The US, after 2007-2008, was able to come out with a very quick response to the banks. Europe cannot, because it's a very different setup. We don't have the United States of Europe yet. That's what the problem is. And the final, final point is to say that, look, you know, these countries at this point are just borrowing to repay. What they really need to get back on the feet are the bonds. Because the debt burden keeps going up and they're more The issue is the things are better. So the solution is not going to be easy either. 
what is the likely outcome? Now, again, common currency requires monetary coordination and fiscal discipline. Okay. Now, there is no denying common currency in Europe brought lots of gains to Europe and lots to Germany as a producer and a lot to Greece and Spain and all these guys as consumers. Okay, everyone gained. The fact of the matter is that cost sharing now going forward is what's the problem. A lot of people just talk about Germany, but it's not just Germany. In fact, if you, if you see what's been happening, the Slovak and the Finnish governments have voted against the Germans. Estonia, as opposed to child of austerity, they've actually, even before retrenched, taken the pain. Okay. Austria and Netherlands are going to go to Germany. So there is, it, there is a split. You have the strong countries and you have the more distant countries. And increasingly, the differences are getting out and out of result. <laughs> now this is where I'm going to go on a bit of a link. A lot of people have been talking about Northern European currency. Uh, a recent article I think came out uh, from J.P. Morgan saying that the most likely country to leave is Italy and the least likely country to leave is Germany. I actually think Germany may step up. Very radical, okay. But you know, there, there are arguments for it. And uh, I think the problem is, again, it's public trust, it's social contract. I think Germans take the social contract very, very seriously. They have to take care of the people, the contingent liabilities in terms of pensions, other social services, welfare. They want to meet. So you, know, you almost have this situation where Merkel maybe has to say, okay, what am I going to do about the future German generations, as opposed to helping out the periphery now and staying live. And the point is like, you know, politics and, 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 and the sort of nationalism in the South and North could gain more and more traction. So I have to be very careful. Again, as I said, these are the world's most majority democracies. People have a say. A lot of people say the small country would be area would be more sustainable. I feel not an easier but a more practical way is perhaps when we say that look, you know, I don't know how to solve this problem. Let's go to a Deutsche Mark and those who are follow, follow them. May work or not work. But at least the, the perceived obligation that now the distant countries are struggling with will settle down. And that will take off a lot of political heat on the region. This is the outlook for Europe. Again, I think I'm just repeating what people have said. But what I'd say is a lot has changed since the early days of the design of the Europe. What has been to be. You have China, which is now definitely dominant. India is there as a potential power. Brazil is there and it's doing extremely well. Russia is becoming more and more aggressive. It's not just economically, but also politically. And then maybe you have Southeast Asia, which is based on trade, Central Asia, which is based on oil and gas. Now, this was not there in the beginning of design for the world. The world has changed. Now, with emerging markets, many of these that have been listed above, and now with cheap data quality exports, the EU and the leadership has to resolve two things. How do you resolve the euro crisis? And how do you find a place for Europe or this common bloc in this changing global dynamic that is happening at this point? Especially with the power shifting away from traditional powerhouses like the US and Japan and Europe. Things are changing. So it's, it's very challenging for them. My own view, again, is a little, a little different, is like I think the EU members, or even the EU as a, as a bloc negotiator, to protect what I think are only very, very high standards. And I think you can see a little bit of that in terms of the nationalist sentiments that are, that are beginning to arise from the anti immigrant political parties. They become increasingly vocal. And that has to be factored in how this EU crisis will, will, will pan out. So, bottom line is, I think slowdown in Europe is very, very real. And it will continue for later. And I think the OECD will be impacted. So, we are. Bit. Why is Pakistan insulated? I'll just give you a little bit of history, which I think most of you will know. Uh, late 80s, early 90s, trade and capital flows, private sector, really replaced IFI bilateral systems. The flow of resources, the motivation for it changed. You have the Asian Tigers in the early 1990s, you have China slowly developing its ports. Becoming a manufacturing of the world. India started opening up after the foreign exchange back in Europe, it's like other investment destinations. Pakistan, on the other hand, 
subcutaneous structure that has got more or less right up to the end of 2001, up to 9-11 effects. With inactive FX reserves and instability and some positive reverses and all this stuff, we effectively missed the whole. There's a lot of talk, I remember, the political governments are trying to promote Pakistan as the next patient fighter. But that was, I think, a lot of wishful thinking. It didn't happen. Right. After 9-11, there was, yes, the boom, uh, credit, credit <coughs> boom, okay? But I think what we see now is like this religious extremism and terrorism that has to take a moment because it's not the economic factors for white Pakistan is going to be world. But again, the problems are still the same. Tax reforms are not happening, inadequate mispriced energy, which is resulting in the sort of shortages we see. Building investment, which is something that we are at the state level increasingly concerned about, energy PSEs, so what do you have? You have a gleaming domestic debt, crowding out, stubborn double digit inflation, and made an investment. Now, unlike the countries that are driving the global economy, Pakistan's trade flows and the domestic economy haven't changed that much in the past two decades. Many of the countries, the, the, the ones who are leading it, have. We have not. So in a sense, like, you know, we didn't get the best parts for it, but we're also protected from the downside. Are Pakistani banks exposed? Because in any sort of financial crisis or what have you, the fastest conduit for the impact is the financial system. Realize that Pakistan's capital account is not free to flow. Still, they are still limits on the exchange of PKR to the foreign exchange, right, for approved transactions. There are also limits on foreign exposure to Pakistani banks in this sense. Right? But the domestic banking system, a very small number of branches are operating overseas. The share in terms of overall profitability of foreign assets is small mm -hmm. and small. Okay. Lending, sort of traditional lending, you know, a big bank London lending to some British corporate, very little. Most of it's traditional trade money. Okay, so our banks are not exposed to what is on the outside. People are saying foreign currency deposits, we have them based on our side. It's the problem now. FE25, the cap 20% of the total deposit base, only at 13 and a half. So we're not even getting the other boundary. And as you can see in the lower graph, the actual amount of dollars invested in the sea is so small. So again, not vulnerable. And realize, all said and done, uh, although we have a requirement that only, you know, these, these, these uh, FE25 is based outside the community investment rate, but the amount is very small. And also realize that even the credit crunch of 2007-2008 really did not have much of an impact on the Pakistan banking system. We had a problem in 2008, but the root causes of that problem were the next time. Are our exports vulnerable? This gives you an idea of how our exports behave, the scope of capital. We just talked about more broad categories. Low value added final products, primarily textiles. Intermediate inputs also primarily textiles, and then you have rising chemicals. Again, there's no, there's no news. We are on the low value added side of things t shirts, bed sheets, towels. We are still exporting cotton yarn, gray cloth, which is processed abroad. And uh, other primary commodities like rice, are have no income and elasticity. So, in a sense, even if there is a slowdown, I don't think Pakistan exports will be impacted that adversely. Again, a point that was raised, I can give you some numbers. If you look at the lower graph, this is basically the per unit cost of our textile exports to the US. This is a comparison with the rest of the world. We are very way down. Again, t-shirts and towels, not exactly high in clothing. So again, just to finalize that point. The impact of global slowdown on Pakistan is <coughs> neutral to positive. Positive, why? Because the price of oil will soften, and there is a possibility simply because of you have a dollar which is getting stronger because the euro is in trouble. You have a possible slowdown in Europe, which is going to slow down in Asia. Okay? Global demand for oil is likely to soften, which means if we have the price of oil coming down, that means a huge impact for us. Five dollars down, average price, will give you Europe almost a billion dollars. That's a lot. Okay. Trade and remittances. What about our export destination? As you can see in the top graph, this green bar basically shows our fraction of exports to Asia. It's rising. In fact, to Europe, it's, uh, it's 
Remittances have shown remarkable growth despite the problems that we've had in the world economy since 2007. <coughs> now, manpower, people, I keep the, the emphasizing in a sense, is really our largest export. The only thing is the receipts from the manpower are not always realized by the commercial bank. Now, that all changed after 9 11 when the holding system was you know, effectively went underground. And you can see this very, very consistent growth. This is two reasons. One is increasingly that money is being channeled through the banks. So that helps. So even if there's a slowdown, that money will come. The other thing is, as job opportunities in Pakistan are not that great, you see something out of the deep. Okay. Now, people have said that, okay, the global crisis, the zero crisis will hit white collar jobs. I agree. But in fact, that may also be a bit of an upside. Because from our information and service that we've done, is the blue collar labor that actually very regularly sends you this is that. The white collars usually buy and invest and stay outside. And if these guys lose their jobs and they have to come to Pakistan, you can expect them to bring a lot of their wealth and savings back. So there is a possible upside again there. Foreign inflows. Pakistan has been born from the IFI, not the international market. That is a huge loss. Yes, this is a very heavy borrowing from the IMF in 2008, but the debt, the foreign debt over GDP, is actually the falling. So, <coughs> effectively, our external debt is not a problem. The market debt, which is your euro bonds and your secours, outstanding, are only 1.6 billion. Okay. This compared to some Greece or whatever, you understand why we're not worried. There are some concerns about repaying the IMF that's been aired a lot in the press and the stuff. But the thing is that it's irre irrelevant. You know, whatever happens, we have data. So if the euro blows up or doesn't blow up, that's, that's something that we've already factored in. To give you an idea, we've been very conservative with our balance of payment projections for next year. We're only looking at 1.2 billion coming into the financial account, which is how you finance your balance of payments. Last year it was 1.5. So we're not expecting more, we're expecting less. We are looking at FDN portfolio of 1.5 primarily because of at this about money coming in. Okay. If that doesn't happen, it will be like close to 700, which is what you want to So it's nothing out of the ordinary. So if you break up the balance of payments between the trade, the remittances, financing, financial accounts, and you net them all up on, 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 on net basis, the balance of payments are actually positive. Neutral to positive. Including IMF and Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. All loans. All loans. IFIs, ADB, World Bank, everything. The problems are the same. They haven't changed, I think, over the past 20 years. But what I'd like to emphasize is the investment. And that's something I'll, I'll touch upon a little bit more on the sides coming forward. The investment rate has declined for the fourth consecutive year. And I'll show you the cloud a bit later. And that's having negative implications on productivity. And that's something else I will show you later on. In fact, the trend GDP, if you look at it, is coming primarily from an increase in labor input alone. That means your population growth, just 2 percent, is driving economic growth. It's not a good place to be. Very little focus on productivity because people are not investing either in the right sort of investment or they're not investing at all. Energy, and I blame all classical econ economists, has always been an ignored factor of production. Even in current textbooks, they will, you'll have land, vehicle, capital, you'll never have energy. But now we realize increasingly that that is perhaps one of the most important source, most important factor of production. The Planning Commission has done some work, and they feel that in Pakistan, the energy shortage itself wipes out 2 to 3% of GDP growth each year. So if you go to about 2.4% last year growth, if we didn't have the energy problem, we'd be at 5.5. That's huge. 
And you have to realize that we need energy, fine, you know, we have to do something about this two or three percent, and we need more to be able to achieve the five or six or six or seven percent to be able to increase the capital GDP. Fiscal always remains and has always remained to be a problem. But the thing is now it's manifesting into domestic debt, which is actually quite frightening. Governments, everyone has talked about, weak institutions, but we still feel that we're resilient in our society that keeps them flowing. Political instability or uncertainty that's in, and increases all of the corruption are things that are undermining the government sector itself. Law and order is not surprise, surprise. I mean, this is like a World Bank driven uh, survey, and out of 142 countries, you can see the Pakistan ranks. Which are the 142nd? I know, I was thinking about that, I should have lost my guy. Uh, Somalia, maybe? Uh, it's it's in Somalia or Afghanistan? Uh, but Somalia doesn't have government, that's so I should have known. I mean, it's bad. You see, the thing is, look, we have economic reasons for why the country is not growing and the non-economic factors. And I think increasingly we're in that realm of non-economic factors that we put in that. This gives you an idea of how we compare the graph on the left, Pakistan and the little black squares. Four consecutive years of falling investments. I mean, forget about China. I mean, look at Sri Lanka, they went through a civil war. Bangladesh, India. And it's coming from both, from private and public investments. Okay, both of them. Still in the next FDI give you an idea of how the global credit crunch, the Great Recession that we can talk about, impacted the world. If you look at the world uh, numbers, uh, FDI, sharp reduction in 2009, surprise, surprise, price prices, right? Uh, hit South Asia, uh, hit everyone else. But notice how East Asia has rebounded much more rapidly than South Asia. And again, China, Hong Kong, Malaysia, Indonesia, Brazil, Brazil, I mean the great countries that if you talk about this, there's not credibility there. They are now driving the economy. Pakistan, Kiri is not that good. Low productivity constraints, you know, like just, uh, you know, these are just some numbers just to give you an idea. Uh, capital per labor, okay, Pakistan low, and falling. Again, labor is increasing more investment. If you look at productivity of labor as a, as a, as a, as a proxy, GDP for labor, um, again, Pakistan is very low. In fact, our own research has shown that about 65% of Pakistan's GDP growth comes from just labor alone. That's it. It's just our population is effectively, in many ways, driving economic growth, which is not good. Total factor productivity, a measure of long term change in technology and distribution capacity of the country, <laughs> also very important to determine what they call the real solo residual, if you guys remember. Pakistan's low again. If you look at the lower table, this is one quick thing I just want to show you. So this is capital per labor. Over time, Pakistan has gone from 2.3, 1.1, 1.1, consistent downward trend. Our investment rate is actually one of the lowest on record. Energy. Uh, you know, I mean, I'll go through the numbers a little bit. Let me tell you what this graph means. I mean, just, just in case uh, the interpretation uh, is a little difficult, I'm going to chop it down. For the last year, episode 12, what this number suggests or says is what about 45% of peak demand for electricity was either not generated or lost. So it's not the capacity, we have the capacity, it's just we're not using it. Almost 45% of your electricity, okay, has not been used to that. This is a big problem. How it affects industries is pretty straightforward, downtime for machines, greater cost for energy generation, obviously disproportionate impact on energy intensive or high-tech industries, which is the way we should be moving. Small firms cannot survive. They want to actually grow into labor-intensive. 
gas shortages across the board, fertilizer, textiles, steel mills, glass, vegetable oil, table oils, it's the more reduces electricity production. And because of that, we have to depend on the furnace oil is expensive, it has payment pressures. And again, I'm not just repeating the thing, it's like two to three percent for that steel. Can I ask a quick question? Sure. Um, what is it mispricing that is causing the excess capacity not to be used, or is it other factors? I think, I think a certain amount is mispricing. I mean, in the case of gas, I think it is. I mean, I have a slight amount of money that household get gas complete. It's just completely out of the <coughs> okay. That, if it is channeled towards even the generation of electricity, and we did an internal paper at the State Bank about it, you would have a net rate of deficient output. You know what I mean? Because I mean, gas is so cheap for households, they overuse it. So it's a bit of mispricing, and then obviously people will say that they get a generation cost, and what you get from billing is gap. And that's what creates a circular debt problem, right? So, you know, it's a bit of both. Can I, can I just go through the whole thing and we can have questions and answers later? Yes, distribution companies, if they send out 100 units, they get the payment for 30 units. So it's not a pricing issue. It's, it's a they 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 I mean, the pricing uh, pricing I'm talking about gas yes. specific. No, so it's not a pricing issue. Well, we'll have that. Okay. Yeah. Fiscal, fiscal. Yeah. Uh, the red line shows you our fiscal deficit. The percentage of GDP you always think of the same. I'm not optimistic about it. I hope we can do it. They're targeting more than 2.6% for this fiscal year. But the burden has been increasing by right, percentage of GDP. Tax collection, I think it's 8 to 9 as long as actually less than 10, because you have to actually include the federal and the provincial government, so I should make a preparation there. But the problem is the tax GDP ratios from four are consistent. It's a big problem. Expenditures in the largest scheme of things have been contained, but the spending mix is a problem. Untargeted subsidies, payments loss, loss making to public sector enterprises, you know, the normal story, squeezing out what should happen, development spending, uh, you know, which is crucial obviously for productivity. <coughs> so it all links up. You have a productivity problem, you have an investment problem, the government can't invest because current expenditure of the government increasingly are higher in budget. And I think something that has happened very acutely last fiscal year, unfortunately, it may also be the case now. Is external financing really is dried up, and that's why, in a sense, the government <coughs> has borrowed so much from banks, and that's creating clear problems for domestic uh, domestic debt, which is here. Now, just have a look at these numbers. Now, this is when things are uh, scary. Ten years, the public debt went from 3.7 trillion to 12.9 trillion. You could give debt servicing, interest, domestic debt servicing, 200 to 810. Okay. Now your public debt to GDP ratio hasn't picked up that much. I mean, because your GDP growth with some normal growth has been has taken place and inflation has been high. But look at the problem with foreign debt or floating debt over domestic debt over the past 10 years. Increasingly, Pakistan's domestic debt is short term. Has most of the repercussions. Okay. During fiscal 11 and 12, the size of the revenue deficit okay, is basically equal to total interest rate, which means all debt servicing now is financed by policy. So that's the debt. Uh, again, I talked about the fact that increasingly we have the short term maturity of our domestic debt creates all sorts of low labor and interest rate risks. There's a backup. Government is always, if it doesn't get the money from the commercial finance, it comes to us. And that has implications for the commercial finance. And the problem of borrowing from commercial banks taking me to a little bit of crowding out or quite a bit of crowding out. But it's very hard to be able to identify with the banks. To, you know, if you go and ask a bank or bank, you will say, PR, there are no credible borrowers. You go and talk to a commercial enterprise, and there's the banks not 
Unfortunately, our data does not allow us to ask back to say, yeah, if you've got five bone requests, how many did you accept? It is all done on four. What you see in terms of private sector credit given is the equilibrium. Right? So we can't tell, but we, we have a view that's a bit of both. It's not a one side of the ticket. No, no, I'm saying is, see, the problem is, we don't know if it is the lack of credible borrowers coming to the commercial banks, or whether the commercial banks are just more interested and more comfortable than the government, right? Because if someone comes to a bank for a loan and gets rejected, it doesn't get documented. What we see in terms of more banks lending is the final problem. Huge such selection. Yeah, absolutely. But the problem is the crowding out, not like selection by, by the bank. It's basically the crowding out by the... Well, that's a debate. Huh? Yeah. We don't know. We don't know. Let me just go through the next couple of slides before we can take questions. Um, again, governance. We talk about it all the time. I thought I'd put a little bit more meat into it. There's an indicator that the World Bank has been doing since 1996. It's based on six different things. You know, voice and accountability, stability, government effectiveness, regulations, rule of law, corruption. Pakistan's not too well off, clearly. The city works. I think that's, that, that's, the, that's the bad thing. The trend over the since 1996 has not been better. Uh, I feel very strongly, I can also agree, it's not just economic policies, however good they are, we cannot deliver under the conditions for economic activity investment. It needs some basic minimum standards. And I'm not just talking about what happens in energy, it's just like you know, security, law and order, corruption, the whole world. Just to focus on the law and order, since uh, a lot of people talk about that, I just thought I'd put some numbers into it as well. This just gives you a comparison of how we are, just in terms of law and order. Okay. Uh, people have no confidence uh, that rules will be followed. And that's a huge issue in the investment. Quality of contract enforcement, property rights, effectiveness of the legal system. These are all detrimental to, to, to investment. And that's why we're not you know, surprised, surprised even in this where we are. Okay, final slide, just to summarize what I've already said. Uh, I think the euro price is building more confidence. <coughs> but it may also pave the way for a certain amount of consolidation in the place. Individual countries looking out for themselves. May happen. I feel the double dip, double recession is already in play. You know, you have a lot of global leaders talking about the economy as a super confidence. And I mean, if you see all the data on the side, for me, the trend seems pretty clear. Pakistan may have missed the issue there, but it did. But now, on the, on the, on the, on the positive side, we're not vulnerable. So, you know, we're sort of like moving along. The challenges remain strictly domestic, I mean, become more acute. Uh, but increasingly, it's these long economic factors that are also driving uh, you know, uh, why investment is, is so low. Inability to do the fiscal reforms is squeezing the economy to almost dysfunctional levels. I mean, you know, fiscal, you want to talk about circular debt in the energy sector, which is one of the reasons why you have idle capacity. The circular debt has its genesis in a fiscal problem, right? If the government had the money to be able to give the disco the difference between the cost of generation and what they get, you wouldn't have a circular debt problem. So it all comes down to fiscal. Any shortage has gone beyond economics, uh, social, political, and I think going forward in these elections and what have you, it's going to be perhaps the most important issue, perhaps. Poor governments go in order, continues to drag economic activity down. These problems can't be solved by outsiders. The problems are known, the structural problems have been the same. It has to be done by by Pakistanis, uh, and you just have to focus. So it's again, basically, it comes down to this That's all I have, and uh, I'd be happy to take questions and answers. Uh, all of this question. Thank you. <coughs>
the, the energy shortages cost us about two to three percent of GDP. Would you venture a guess as to the cost of GDP growth of the non-economic issues that you <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to spot at all. No, no, in fact, because I would actually go with the same, you know, if energy can be 2 or 3%, I'm thinking that non-economic should at least be 2 right. And the thing is, understand that the energy problem really has been in, I would say, the past few years. Right. So before that, if I, you know, it's really hard, you know, because you can't take out the 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 you not spending on unproductive security type things. If foreign investors are willing to come and see Pakistan, it could boost your export industry, right? Uh, you know, you don't have, if you have a proper legal address system, quick efficient decisions being made, the rule of law being made, uh, contractual laws. I think this this Low order that is uh, it's an alibi. It's an alibi because for the right thing, the investment, investment will come. They could be. But right? that is over to Canada and Mr. or Chile, Baba. Biggest gold in Baba countries in the world. They invested about half a billion dollars and wanted to start the mine, right? Now, if three and a half billion dollars by world mineral, biggest mineral multinationals were to invest in the most troubled part of the most troubled province of Pakistan and put in three and a half billion dollars, would that have a great deep love? Because people here, and by the way, you know, this cost of terrorism is very dangerous and it's very difficult to estimate. So someone doesn't set a bank up in Norshela, he sets it up in Chicago. He doesn't set it up outside Quetta, he sets it up in uh, Muta. So the investment, investment gets transferred, but not the uh, One second, gas, gas, Engel, does a $1.2 billion expansion, doesn't get gas for a year. How good an investment is that for modern investment? It's got IFC in it between 5% and 10 well, so, 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 so let's not hide behind tennis. No, 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 I'm not. No, no, you're, you're not, you're not, but we generally are. We're saying, you know, we've lost it's, it's, 300 million dollars. I, I, I completely agree. In fact, that's why, again, I'll be very honest with you in my private views again. It, it's very convenient to blame outside factors or something that you have no control over. Okay. Ah, uh, they go floods over. The global crisis over. Yeah. That's why we are, we are. There's no denying that we have made enough wonders here to actually be the provider. We've made sovereign commitments, England, you know, and yet we, we go the other way. The point is, everyone sees this. And you know, this, what do you say? And you say it's not just rule of law, it's not just security, it is the quality of your leadership or the commitments of your, of your government, which has no credibility. Okay, the question was about non economic factors, not just terrorism. I mean, yeah. I think you know, you're including, uh, including that all these governance issues as well, and credibility. And the facts are on the table. You know, if you look at a, a, a bank like Citibank, um, removing its consumer franchising, dramatically shrinking its corporate franchise, the HSBC disappearing. Uh, I think there are, signals, there are signals here. Now, whatever we may or may not believe about the terrorism and governance may have a large economic impact uh, on the Pakistani economy. Clearly, foreign investors are not as sanguine as we are. Yeah, you get used to it. Not the ones you know, local investors are the ones. But the thing is, I think even then, you know, I mean, I believe, I mean, let's say I've heard, uh, now there's less houses, right? I, mean, I believe now they're even going to brokerage houses. They're going into white collar offices, air conditioning, all this stuff, and say, okay, here's a man. That's, that's scary stuff. Take some kind of person. So he has a question. He has a question. Hold on for a second. He has a question. So my question has to do with the, with the, the lack of resources. Right. Oh, yeah. So I have a question regarding uh, crowding out um, the private sector. 
from what I observe that the banks uh, prefer to lend to the government at the 11% rather than the private sector at the 10%. That's because the high interest rate. So, um, furthermore, we've seen that interest rate has come to counter inflation and has worked well because we have imported inflation to oil. So, um, why, how do you support uh, the government's policy to cut interest rates, bring interest rates to a point that the private sector, the banks are disincentivized to lend to the government rather than go automatically to the private sector?
the reason we're doing this is to actually educate ourselves and to show some results to say that maybe small scale agricultural lending should not be done in one day. It should be done for a vendor system, you know, where your fertilizer, your pesticides, your seeds, all your seeds are provided by a specialized institution that charges of a commercial basis. So we're trying this out. Well, just since you're on that subject, Viva uh, Ahmed is setting up yeah. a, a framework. This framework is working with a framework of intermediaries who are financeable. Uh, you know, call them some distribution heads who are financeable. And now that might be SO in the yeah. region. It might be somebody else that interfaces with them. They take the credit from the banks. They buy the, the tractor, they buy the seeds, they buy the inputs, and these are the tractors we will give you pound down the it. And the banks are then dealing with these aggregators who then take on groups of 100 farmers, so the banks can't cover 100 farmers. But the reality can, he covers 10 villages. So, this, so India has done this very successfully. We got the idea from there. Yes. Uh, so the state bank is building, building this up. And about six months' time, you should have the first aggregator ready. And if it's well known name, I don't know who the individual is, but it's a well-known name, which is putting in a large amount of money. Number yeah. two, India, about 20% of India's agricultural financing happens through warehouse receipts. In places like the Philippines, it might be 70%. Pakistan, 0%. India has moved from zero to 20 Now, the first thing you need to that is warehouse. Quality warehouse. We're not willing to set them up. So, in the state bank, we tried to get the government of Punjab, which has got you, the government public sector has gone half in this way, uh, we should try to take over a lot of that warehouse. We got a, a, a well-known Swiss company to manage the warehouse. There will be automatic, well, not that warehouse, there will be 50 warehouses all over the area. What, what would happen is that the uh, produce would turn up, the laboratory would, it's a mobile laboratory, the thing about the size of the computer. They test the product, they put the product in the warehouse, give the farmer a receipt, and uh, a copy will be generated at the National Commodity Exchange. The farmer takes the receipt to the bank, the bank would confirm, bank would confirm that the you know, stock exchange would confirm ownership. Would confirm ownership and they'd either finance it, so that he kept the upside, he could the commodity price is growing. Or he sold if he wanted to sell. Now we've gone quite far down the line. We've got four Pakistani banks to put in equity to create a company that will manage the warehouse. And this is all going to be electronically connected to the banks and to the National Commodity Exchange. For so the first time, we'll have, what does the National Commodity Exchange do, do you know? It's like a foreign exchange of gold. And it was set up to create a forward market in every single agricultural commodity, in, in dal, in various commodities of rice, in wheat, in sugar. You can't vote one. And you can't vote one if you can't vote uh, most transactions might be financially settled. In other words, you don't have to deliver the, deliver the physical but often you do. And particularly in agriculture, a lot of people do actually take uh, both forward for delivery, not for financial transactions. So you need uh, so, so they've been idle. They're, they're very keen to join this. So we've created a uh, state bank has created this company by the time I left and I don't know where it is, where that's got the banks, it's got the energy monetary exchange and it's got the Swiss company as an investor. Now I think of where it's going beyond that, but those are two very important Initiatives I, you know, I'd say that the state bank has taken to widen finance yeah, uh, and yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we, you know, we, get, we get a lot of uh, bad press in the media. Yeah. There are yeah. initiatives, which actually is in the results of that, is the one who actually started the, uh, the warehouse receipt system. It's, it's mm -hmm. moving along. Mm -hmm. It's still trying to get, uh, yeah. I think, from the parties has changed, so now the bank is having it. But it's a part of it. But, so yeah, we're doing things like that. I mean, uh, Nebar, in fact, this whole agricultural little experiments that we're doing is in collaboration with uh, Ahmed and Diba. Yeah. So it's me here yeah. and he's in some part. Yeah. So we're taking these initiatives uh, <coughs> because we feel very strongly that the banks really don't know how to do it. So we're gonna, you know, we, I think we can do it, but we can help them. Yeah. Yeah. Can you please? Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. She's got the mic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 And I want to take you back to yeah. the yeah. 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 Uh, you know, so the U.S. citizens are 
payment of tax from wherever they earn their income. Right? So you have to really give a declaration that uh, you know you do not hold any U.S. customer. Uh, you know, it is not uh, a declared one, and you haven't declared it to the U.S. authority. And that is the very far-reaching implications on the banking system, right? I mean, if we have uh, have a settlement uh, uh, to make in the U.S. Uh, and if we pay that amount, irrespective of whether you know uh, that money pertains to U.S. citizen or not, uh, those authorities have a right to deduct the from the proceeds of that payment. And, and, you know, so how would it, because, you know, you, you mentioned about the identity, and these are some of the things that you probably would be. Uh, so you think that this automatic possible deduction of 30%, yes. uh, now how would, uh, now you have just a question, how would that impact what? Uh, how that yeah. That's for American citizens, right? I mean, the things I know that how Right. Uh, commercial banks won't let you put up 
we have such a exposure on that to say that we have to pay money there, just as the other thing is, and then we have to do that. People said, well, we have to do that. So we said, yeah, because that's a negative connotation as well. It's like basically you, you, you raising the, the, the risk. You raise the price to say that the government will not accept that, right? Which clearly can not happen on your domestic debt. Okay, you see, let me go. Let me click to that because this is the price. This has happened. Meaning there have been wrong returns in the board. Yeah, I mean, by, by Russia, 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 by I'm not thinking of it. Continue the government, Chandra to Chandra at this point, right? We do not want to go in and put regulations to say that we are going to cut it, we are going to We are trying to signal, and we are hoping that the banks will balance out the behavior. And we'll see how it goes. Okay, so there's the last question. Uh, so we'll be the last question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Sorry, the last question. Uh, as you said, Pakistan has been insulated from the euro crisis. So, uh, like, uh, perhaps, okay, partly because of the reason, because we have a domestic banking system. So, here the central bank rules comes in that uh, why it is first generation banking system, still now, why we are not reforming it. And still, another area uh, in Pakistan, the inequality is rising very, very much rapidly, and like, what kind of work central bank because uh, here here a lot of toll of central bank comes in. So like if the investment is not coming in, so so there is central bank rules also that the investment climate can be created in, in Pakistan. Inflation is rising, so here central bank rules comes in. So like how we are targeting these areas? Financial excess is 14 percent. Just 14 percent of population is targeted. We also have to be very careful. We cannot start talking about uh, income inequality. I mean, we can try to target it by saying, okay, let's go and uh, give loans to the poor, what have you, small guys, or farmers. We can, we can indirectly try to do it, but we can't do it as a goal. Right? We are concerned about the investment, not because you know, we love the country, but also, we're also concerned about the balance of banks. Right? We need to make sure that banks are doing their jobs, you know, that they're not being stopped with credit. So we have priorities. Inflation is there, exchange rate stability is there, having your reserves comfortable is there, banks of payments is very important, and also bank sheets of the bank. So we keep it limited to that and obviously financial. Thank you very uh, much,